So we, uh, Tom and I, divided these abstracts so that there would be no overlap. So I'm going to be talking mostly about resection, closure, and a little bit more. Uh, and he'll be talking about endoscopic ultrasound and ERCP. So these are my disclosures. So when, when I thought of abstracts uh, that would make sense, I thought of you know the utility of closure devices after EMR and ESD. And two of those abstracts are going to concentrate on this. Then comparison of different EMR techniques. We're also going to talk about the new gastroduodenal full thickness resection device. Uh, also look at outcomes. And this, this abstract kind of flabbergasted me. Outcomes after endoscopic management of low risk and high risk T1A esophageal adenocarcinoma. And then finally, this really neat uh, potential uh, tool down the road, duodenal mucosal regeneration in patients with type 2 diabetes. So first, we're going to start off with closure. This abstract by the uh, Netherlands, it's uh, clip placement does not prevent delayed bleeding after EMR for large polyps in the proximal colon. This was a, randomi uh, uh, a randomized control trial as a multi-center trial. And we all know that colorectal EMR is standard treatment for large non-pedunculated colon polyps. Um, the problem is delayed bleeding, right? A two to 10%, it's always when you're on your way to a conference or going on vacation. Um, we know that prophylactic clipping was reported to reduce or is reported to reduce delayed bleeding in large proximal polyps, and you can see the references there. Um, and these trials were mainly performed in tertiary care centers. So the design of this study is a randomized controlled trial. 19 hospitals, so 13 of them are non-university. So the question is, the prior data, is it generalizable to um, you know, the general gastroenterologist in private and uh, tertiary care centers? Um, they looked at prophylactic clipping versus no clipping. And again, these are EMR of non-pedunculated polyps greater than two centimeters in size in the proximal colon. And what they defined as proximal colon is anything proximal to the splenic flexure. So if you look at the baseline characteristics, okay, there were, first of all, 177 in the clipping group and 179 in the non-clipping group. Again, they are randomized. Um, and you can see the baseline characteristics are very similar, including those patients that underwent treatment with antiplatelet agents and anticoagulants. The other thing is the mean size of the polyp was 33 millimeters. Now, those three other trials that we saw that were referenced, actually the lesions were a bit larger, so um, that's one difference. And then if you look at the location, they were similar in both groups, and the majority of the, of the lesions were ascending colon and cecum. So when they did close, um, the closure rate was about 78%, just as an aside. So what are the results here? Well, believe it or not, there was no difference in delayed bleeding in the group that underwent clipping and those that did not. So the question is here, perhaps we can be more selective about which patients to clip after EMR of the proximal colon polyps. I mean, in this day of age, you know, of cost-effective medicine, um, you know, will this sway us to not necessarily close all um, proximal colon polyps? And places I still would, would um, consider doing it are in high-risk patients for bleeding and numerous comorbidities. Now, I in my practice still routinely, if I can close, will close, but I think with more and more data, um, we'll be able to better define, you know, do we really need to close these all? Next is another um, abstract uh, um, looking at the closure time, technical success, and cost effectiveness between the uh, scope helix tax suture system and the uh, scope suturing system for closure of gastric and colorectal ESD uh, defects. So again, it's that helix system, um, which was FDA approved in the TAC Helix system in 2020. And then again, we have the uh, over the scope closure system. So they're comparing both. And the trial design is a single center prospective randomized trial of consecutive adults undergoing ESD in the stomach, the colon, and the rectum. And they were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion between each closure uh, technique. 
The endoscopist was blinded until the resection was completed. Once they resected, they were told, you know, you're going to go ahead and use either the TAC system, um, suturing system, or the over-the-scope uh, uh, suturing system. And then crossover was allowed when failure uh, happened. Primary outcome was the following. Closure time, which is time from the first bite or TAC application to the last suture. Um, cinch or endo, uh, endoclip application. And then the overall closure time was end of dissection hemostasis time to the last suture cinch or endoclip application. In other words, the overall closure time included the setup of the equipment. Secondary outcomes were technical success, intraprocedural or delayed adverse events, cost-effective analysis. Um, and so what they saw is if you look at the demographics and the location and specimen size, they're very comparable between the groups. Um, even the number of uh, patients who underwent uh, resection in the colon was equal in both groups. And the average length in both groups was four centimeter, the mean length. So again, very comparable groups. What they did is they had 40 patients total and they randomized 20 to the over the scope suturing and 20 to the tax system, the helix tax system. In the over the scope uh, suturing system, um, 17 were successful. There were failure in three. Uh, one in the proximal colon was left open, one in the proximal colon was switched to the helix tack, and uh, one in the gastric fundus actually neither one worked so they actually used an um, over the scope clip and then in the other group uh, success was 18 um, and uh, a lot of times with the helix tack if you guys use it you know sometimes it just does not necessarily uh, go in far enough especially if it's fibrotic so the results really were no difference in closure time and overall closure time um, and intraprocedural perforation was higher in the overscope suturing uh, system. However, it was not related to the actual suturing itself, um, and delayed bleeding was the same. I do want to show you that the this was um, study was not powered to evaluate delayed uh, adverse events, but nonetheless, the primary endpoints of closure time and overall closure time did not change. So what's the bottom line? Well, um, you know, the, the other thing is the cost analysis. They did a cost analysis, and what they saw is that um, the cost was the same except for lesions that were less than 35 millimeters. So defect closure can be performed with either device. Um, and this is helpful. This is helpful information so that if we go there and we resect, then we don't necessarily have um, access to either device. If we have one or the other, we can feel more confident that it's, it's okay based on this small randomized trial. Um, again, closure time, efficacy, and adverse events are similar. Um, and again, perhaps maybe in smaller lesions, um, the helix tax system um, may be uh, more cost effective. But again, we need larger trials. So now let's talk about EMR technique. Um, so this uh, abstract, the superiority of cold snare EMR compared to traditional EMR for large colorectal polyps was a systemic review, systematic review and meta-analysis. And the question is, they were looking to see whether one was superior to the other by conducting a systematic review and meta-analysis of cold versus hot EMR of colon polyps. So they did a comprehensive literature search and they included trials that compared hot versus cold in terms of adverse events. And then they looked at all the uh, cohort studies um, that looked at cold, the adverse events of cold along, alone. And they did a meta-analysis with random effect modeling. And what they found was they had 14 um, studies that they included, four were compar uh, comparative, and those were about 1,071 patients. And the rest of them were cohort studies. In terms of delayed bleeding, what they saw was delayed bleeding favored cold EMR in terms of lower uh, um, numbers of delayed bleeding. And this was statistically significant. And there was no heterogeneity in this. So this looks like a real finding, um, which is a huge advantage. Uh, in the cohort studies, they just saw that the pooled rate of delayed bleeding with cold was 2%. 
And then in terms of perforation, it was higher in um, those that underwent hot EMR. This was not statistically significant, but it did trend to favor cold EMR. And then in terms of recurrence, um, again, there was a trend towards uh, cold EMR, and this is kind of a little bit against what you would think. You would think if you're using heat, it would be, you know, you use cautery and then you would get greater margins theoretically. So very interesting study. So cold EMR is associated with lower risk of delayed bleeding and trend to lower perforation. The la latter is non-significant, but there was a trend. There's no difference in early bleeding, residual polyp or polyp recurrence. My takeaway is, you know, I've been really changing my practice to do more and more cold EMR. I found that uh, bleeding sometimes it looks like hamburger meat. It looks really, really kind of bloody. So I inject a little bit of uh, 1 to 100,000 epi uh, to, to raise the lesion before doing cold EMR, but uh, it tends to minimize the oozing. Now, Patrick Ocolo had a, um, a poster. Um, he's at Rochester with the same, uh, again, a meta-analysis on the same topic, and his conclusion was the same. So cold EMR is safer with a lower incidence of delayed bleeding. So again, this is exciting stuff. Now we're going to transition into the upper GI tract. Here, um, we're going to be talking about clinical efficacy and safety of a novel over-the-scope gastroduodenal full thickness resection device for the treatment of upper GI lesions. This is a large multi-center experience. Um, here, this is different than the colonic full thickness device, which we've had for years. This has been FDA approved, the gastric duodenal one in 2020. It's a little bit smaller. It's more compatible with the, with the upper endoscope. Um, it's got decreased inter, uh, dental space to reduce the risk of bleeding. And again, um, intubation can be tricky, so they have this balloon system that facilitates that. And the aim of the study was to evaluate the efficacy and safety of a newly designed um, gastroduodenal full thickness resection device for the resection of upper GI lesions. It's a multi-center trial. Um, it was retrospective. Uh, they were all adults. Gastric full thickness uh, resection of upper GI lesions from uh, 6 2020 to 8 2022 were included, and the outcomes were technical success on block resection, R0 resection, lesion size, foregut location, wall layer, and adverse events. And when you look at the lesion characteristics that they looked at, 80% of them were in the stomach, 43% uh, of them were submucosal. Um, other thing you'll notice is that the lesion size was 11.8, but the resection lesion size was 17.6. So you're not taking out huge lesions, but nonetheless, um, you're, you're taking out lesions that you normally would have some difficulty taking out elsewhere or otherwise. The resection outcomes show that unblocked resection was 91%. Uh, histologic margin uh, R0 resection was 71%, and most of these were neuroendocrine tumors or GISTs. Complications, really no major uh, immediate bleeding, delayed bleeding, there were two, and they were handled endoscopically. So my takeaway from this is that this provides us as endoscopists with another tool to resect small adhered lesions and subepithelial lesions of the upper GI tract, which can be pesky. We all know that uh, we see tons of subepithelial lesions, and maybe this will afford us a, a way of removing this. This was interesting in that this is outcomes after endoscopic management of low risk and high risk T1A esophageal adenocarcinoma. It's a multi center study. The reason it's important is that we all take out early lesions. And when we look at the NCN and guidelines, um, they say that these are better resected endoscopically than surgically. Um, and so uh, you know, endoscopic eradication therapy is standard for T1A esophageal cancers, and the aim of this was to assess and compare outcomes after eradication of low-risk and high-risk T1A esophageal cancers, including intraluminal um, esophageal cancer recurrence, extraesophageal metastases, and overall survival. So this was at Mayo and three clinic sites. They looked retrospectively. They took all of the um, data from 1996 to 2022. 
High risk was defined as poorly differentiated or the presence of lymphovascular invasion. Low risk was well to um, moderately differentiated without uh, lymphovascular invasion. And clinical outcomes were intraluminal um, esophageal cancer recurrence, extraluminal metastases, and overall survival. And again, a Kaplan-Meier estimates were used to compare outcomes in the groups. There were a total of 188 patients, uh, 45 of these were high risk and 143 of these were low risk. Uh, baseline characteristics were the same uh, in terms of age, gender, et cetera. The only difference obviously was a grade of dif differentiation of the tumor um, and the presence of lymphovascular invasion separating low risk from high risk. Scary thing about this is that, you know, I. I consider when I resect these that uh, I, I don't necessarily aggressively cross-sectional imaging or, or do any of that. But when they looked at it, you looked at the extra um, esophageal mats was 11.1% in the high-risk T1A lesions, a little higher than the data we, we see in the literature. Um, that's a four time numerical higher rate than in the high-risk group than the low-risk group. So my take home from this is, you know, maybe uh, we need to be really following these patients um, kind of a little bit more aggressively than than we thought especially and look at the path you know there is a huge difference it appears between um, the lower um, low risk and high risk t1a lesions so one more abstract uh, which i could not help but uh, present, this is so cool, duodenal mucosal regeneration induced by endoscopic pulsed electric field treatment improves glycemic control in patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, this is a device that gets advanced over a guide wire with endoscopic vision and fluoroscopic guidance. It's non-thermal. Uh, it generates high voltage ultra short uh, pulse fields, and it increases cell permeability resulting in mucosal cellular apoptosis. Um, and what you do is you, you deploy it and you have to go obviously distal to the um, ampulla, obviously you do not want to get near the ampulla. And what they do is uh, sequentially in two centimeter uh, increments uh, go down um, and use the equipment. Now you want to treat at least six centimeters. Um, again, it's over a wire, fluoroscopic guidance, and patients are intubated for this. And so they looked at, um, they, they assessed the feasibility, safety, and efficacy of this applied to the duodenum in patients with type 2 diabetes. This was a multi-center, open-label, single-arm trial, um, and patients had to be on stable medications 12 weeks before and and continue those medications 24 weeks post-procedure. So we're talking about their anti-glycemic agents. They were obviously followed uh, very, very closely. And if you look at the baseline characteristics of the 41 patients they actually analyzed, uh, the mean age was 50, the hemoglobin A1C uh, mean value was 8.7. 8 um, a duration of diabetes, they were all less than 10 years, and all of them were on at least one um, glucose-lowering medication. Um, now, if you look at this, uh, there was two generations of the device. The first generation, um, you can see they used 600 volts once, and then they noted that they actually got better results if they actually did two treatments per two centimeter segment. So what did they see? If you look at responder rate by energy doses, um, you can see that the hemoglobin A1C improvement of greater than 1% was 53% at 24 weeks in those patients that underwent the double uh, dosing. And then the complete responders, I mean, they're talking about a hemoglobin A1C going to less than 7% was 35% at 24 weeks. So not perfect, but nonetheless, exciting news. And on top of that, patients were losing weight. Um, the percent weight loss uh, was at 24 weeks uh, was statistically significant. Uh, sorry, I pressed this the wrong time. But anyway, um, and also uh, insulin resistance um, was much less after treatment um, in a good percentage of patients. So this is exciting new technology. Um, and I just had to share it because I thought it was exciting. Um, so in summary, clip closure of right-sided EMR sites may not prevent delayed bleeding like once 
we once thought so it'd be really interesting to see if we can further identify with big uh, randomized controlled trials which groups we should and which groups we shouldn't um, when closing esd defects either suturing or tacking is appropriate cold emr may be just as efficacious as hot emr um, with uh, fewer uh, cases of delayed bleeding um, the gastric full thickness resection device, which is FDA approved in 2020, may really be a benefit for adhesed and subepithelial lesions. And patients with high risk T1A esophageal cancer um, treated endoscopically really need to be followed carefully because the Mayo data shows that uh, they may be higher risk for metastasis than we thought. And then again, this recellularization uh, via the electroporation therapy may prove to be an effective treatment for type 2 diabetes. And with that, I want to thank you all. Appreciate the opportunity.